Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the ACP Problem Solving and Oncology webinar series. I'm Dr. Rachel Broadbent. I'm a member of the ACP Trainees Committee and a registrar in medical oncology at the Christie Hospital in Manchester. I'll be chairing this evening's session. This evening's webinar is going to give you an overview of preventive therapies for breast cancer and breast cancer clinical genetics. The educational content of this evening's meeting are entirely non-promotional, but we're proud to have the webinar series sponsored by Pfizer, SI and Roche, world leaders in oncology pharmaceuticals. Our webinars are recorded and will be made available on the EBN Health ACP library website within a couple of weeks. This is free for all ACP members and you can also access all of the ACP problem solving in oncology book series within the library. So I now have the pleasure to welcome and introduce our first speaker of the evening. Dr. Sasha Howell is a senior lecturer and honorary consultant medical oncologist at the University of Manchester and the Christie Hospital. He trained in medical oncology at the Christie and gained his PhD in 2006, studying the role of prolactin in breast cancer stem cell regulation. He was appointed senior lecturer in breast oncology at the University of Manchester in October 2010 and works closely with the basic scientists in the Manchester Breast Centre, focusing on the translation of novel approaches to targeting normal and cancer stem cells into breast cancer prevention and treatment. His professional time is divided between the care of clinical, uh, clinical care of patients at the Christie Hospital and basic and translational research programme at the CRUK Manchester Institute. He specialises in the treatment of patients with early and advanced breast cancer. So, Dr. Howell, when you're ready, over to you. Um, please go ahead and share your slides. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, I also work now at the um, Manchester University Foundation Trust in the Nightingale Centre, which is the central picture on this slide, and that's where the prevention clinics take place. Uh, and it's that that I'm going to be talking about primarily today. So um, this is what I wanted to talk about. I want to talk about nice guidance um, for who is at high risk uh, and what we treat with, what drugs are available, what are the key messages when it comes to the side effects of those drugs, uh, both in terms of the incidence, but also the strategies for side effect management. Uh, and then I also just want to touch on three slides each for surgical prevention and lifestyle prevention. Um, because despite the fact that we are medical oncologists, drugs aren't everything. So, nice familial breast cancer guidelines first came out in 2004, and they've been through a number of updates since, uh, rapidly thereafter in 2006. Uh, and then in 2013 is when tamoxifen was um, first approved uh, by NICE. And then in 2017, a Nastrozole came along uh, to be approved as well. And there is also raloxifen, which we'll talk about a little bit, but tamoxifen and anastrozole is really where we're at. And what the NICE guidance does is it gives us the definitions of risk. Um, and this is from the updated guidance in 2017. Uh, and there are three categories of, of risk. There's near population, moderate risk and high risk. Um, and it's a slightly difficult way of doing it, but what we have to do is to try and anchor this risk somewhere. And so the 10 year risk is anchored at from age 40. Uh, and so less than 3% is considered uh, population level. Three to 8% 10 year risk at 40 is considered moderate risk and above 8% high risk. And then a lifetime risk of breast cancer, less than one in six is considered population about one in three to one in six is moderate and a, a more than a one in three risk of developing breast cancer over your entire lifetime is considered high risk. So what does NICE recommend? Well, annual screening from 40 to 50 for those at moderate risk and 40 to 60 for those at high risk. I've just been talking um, to the team before coming on saying I wanted to get rid of the word chemo prevention and I've even put it on one of my own slides. So preventive therapy um, for those aged 40 to 50, we should consider, uh, and for, sorry, for, sorry, those at moderate risk, we should consider, uh, and for those at high risk, we should offer. And I'm gonna say what NICE means by those statements in a second. Lifestyle advice should be given for all and risk-reducing surgery should be offered to those 
um, at high risk. So what is the NICE guidance? What does it mean when it says uh, that we should offer or consider? Because to me, those mean fairly similar things. Uh, and the NICE guidance is that recommendations should be followed as a strong recommendation when we use the word offer. So similar to the word as refer or advise, uh, and when we're confident that for the vast majority of people, following the recommendation will do more good than harm or will be cost effective, slightly toned down when we're using the word consider. So in that situation, the, 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 the benefit risks is, is perhaps slightly more balanced, uh, and there may be some personal reasons why people are more likely to decline. Uh, and the words that I would use there are recommend. So we should be recommending preventive therapy for women at high risk and discussing it as a viable option uh, for women who are at moderate risk. But for premenopausal women, tamoxifen for five years is recommended uh, and is now licensed for prevention um, as of 2018. So despite the fact that it was generic, AstraZeneca paid the 70 to 80,000 pounds to get, take the drug through licensing. Uh, they are not that keen on doing that again for an astrazole, um, but we're looking at an alternative approach to get that licensed. Currently isn't, but it is the NICE approved recommended approach for um, postmenopausal women. That is unless they have severe osteoporosis um, or the patient doesn't want an astrazole and when they can consider raloxifene if they uh, still have a uterus or tamoxifen if not. Importantly, um, and if you would like to read the NICE guidance, that's the reference at the bottom, an astrazole in high risk patients saves the NHS money. Uh, and so in the cost utility analysis performed uh, as part of the NICE guidance, uh, we can see that an astrazole is dominant, which means that it is cost saving for that group uh, and is certainly cost effective um, for women at moderate risk as well. So what drugs are available and how do they work? And this is this is really for um, first year registrars. I hope the rest of you will know how tamoxifen and astrazole work, but I think it's worthwhile just touching on that. So um, estrogen binds its receptor to stimulate proliferation in the normal breast. This is an example on the top right of a bit of normal breast with a lobule and the brown staining is the ER in the tissue in the epithelial cells. Um, what we've got here is a ribbon diagram of uh, the oestrogen receptor. Uh, and we've got oestrogen sitting here in the ligand binding domain. We've got helix 12 closed over the top, uh, which opens up activation function 2. So with my little schematic, that's what happens. Oestrogen binds, closes, co-activators bind onto the receptor or interact with the receptor, and we get gene transcription. Um, and in the case of the normal breast, this is to signal the cells to, to divide. Moxifen, on the other hand, sits in, uh, in the ligand binding domain, doesn't allow helix 12 to close, so you don't get this exposure of AF2 to the same degree. You get some exposure, uh, and then you get much less in terms of coactivator binding. But this is tissue specific. And that's important when we consider that we're trying to consider the side effects uh, of tamoxifen, uh, which is contrary uh, to, to an astrazole, which is an aromatase inhibitor. But with tamoxifen, we get both estrogen antagonist effects, where it is working to antagonize or block the effect of estrogen. But in addition to that, we can have estrogen agonistic effects, such as uterine hyperplasia. Uh, and cancer in postmenopausal women, vaginal discharge, thromboembolism, and side effects which are actually beneficial, such as the increased bone health in postmenopausal women and cholesterol reduction. So that's all those ones on the right hand side of the slide. That's tamoxifen acting like estrogen, uh, like an agonist. As I just said, an astrazole is an aromatase inhibitor, it blocks the production of estrogen. Yeah, and you, therefore we only get antagonistic side effects uh, and, um, in, in stark contrast to, to tamoxifen. This is really key when you're looking at adjuvant 
studies because there are no placebo controlled adjuvant studies now it's tamoxifen versus anastrozole and so you are uh, unable to disentangle um, what is an a benefit from agonist from tamoxifen versus an, an antagonist effect of uh, anastrozole uh, without the placebo arm um, in those clinical trials so how effective is preventive medication well, we've got multiple clinical trials, and what I've put up here are the tamoxifen trials, of which there are four. Uh, these were meta-analyzed by Jack Cusick back in 2013, uh, which is where this paper's from, uh, and three raloxifene trials, more and core, which was really core was an extension of the more trial. Ruth, um, as Ruth Moore and core was, was studies looking at uh, tamoxifen versus placebo. Whereas the STAR trial was a head-to-head -head comparison of tamoxifen against raloxifene. And then I put the IBIS-2 trial of anastrozole up there as well. So you would have said, just looking at those um, risk reductions of about 0.67 uh, for uh, tamoxifen, it's a little bit higher, about 0.6 for raloxifene, you'd have said, well, the raloxifene must be better. But in the head-to-head -head STAR trial, Tamoxifen was superior to raloxifene uh, with a relative risk of 1.24. So this just shows you you need care in cross-trial comparison. Uh, and we would generally recommend the use of, of tamoxifen above raloxifene if we can in postmenopausal women. We'll come on to the side effects that limit its use in a second. Um, it's a reasonable approximation to say that pre, in premenopausal women, there's about a 35% reduction in risk with tamoxifen. In postmenopausal women, probably about 50%, that's from the IBIS-2 trial reduction with anastrozole, that's fair enough. And then 40% with TAM and about 30% with raloxifene. But those are quite broad figures. Uh, and as I said, they are approximations. Now there's a public health warning uh, and the reason that I want to mention this public health warning is that there's quite a big move now um, from certain GPs some private GPs and a lot of celebrities to say that HRT is a panacea and it should be given to all um, and unfortunately this particular GP um, who's quite a powerful GP in, Man in the Manchester region is keen for us to be prescribing HRT for women who have had a diagnosis of breast cancer and may even be on drugs like tamoxifen or even aromatase inhibitors. But the tamoxifen benefit is completely lost with HRT. And that was in the IBIS-1 study in which 40% of patients had um, HRT um, to help with the side effects or just with menopausal symptoms. It was slightly more in the tamoxifen arm had HRT than in the uh, the placebo arm. But in those women who were on tamoxifen, if they took um, HRT, there was no preventive effect. So I think we just need to, I think most oncologists in the room would acknowledge that they wouldn't do that. But I think we just need to be very strong with our arguments uh, to push back on people who want to prescribe HRT for those who've had a diagnosis of particularly ER positive breast cancer. In terms of ER positivity, those are the types of cancer that are pre prevented with uh, drugs like uh, tamoxifen and raloxifene. And you can see here that the ER positive reduction is, you know, looking at the meta-analysis is just over 50%. Whereas if anything for ER negative, there is a slight increase in the risk of ER negative breast cancer, um, but that's not statistically significant. DCIS, the majority of which is ER positive, is also reduced. Now, importantly, as the uh, recommendation is for five years of treatment, a lot of women ask, well, what happens when I stop? Uh, and it, you know, that there are only two trials that have looked at long-term follow-up, and that's IBIS-1 and IBIS-2. And reassuringly, with a median follow-up now of 16 years in IBIS-1 and 11 years in IBIS-2, both show a persistent reduction in breast cancer incidence um, over those, uh, those periods. 
So five years of treatment, the effect does not seem to wear off. I would just make a, a little comment here though, but we know from adjuvant breast cancer treatment trials that 10 versus five years of TAM or AI further reduces contralateral events. The argument for not giving 10 years of AI is predominantly because it doesn't seem to reduce distant recurrence and improve survival. But I would argue that we might be able to do better for women at very high risk of breast cancer with longer durations of prevention. But for the time being, that's not approved. And so the recommendation is for five years. What are the key messages when it comes to side effects? Well, first of all, let's deal with the groups of patients that, uh, that we're actually uh, trying to talk about. So for premenopausal women, these data aren't yet published, um, but these are from IBIS-1 and they're from just from the premenopausal cohort. And so the predominant side effects you can see down right at the bottom there is hot flushes and about 49 and a half, so 50% of women get hot flushes with tamoxifen in the first year. It's very unlikely that they are going to get hot flushes related to tamoxifen beyond that. But of course, they might. If they're premenopausal. Most of the premenopausal women in IBIS-1 were aged 45 to 50. So if they then develop menopause, if they go into menopause, then of course they may have hot flushes, but that's not drug related. So about half of women have hot flushes in, in the premenopause um, because of tamoxifen. You can see that about 28% have hot flushes in relationship to placebo. Um, some interference with um, vaginal bleeding, um, postcoital bleeding. Um, tamoxifen is known to suppress periods and it makes them irregular, which can be very annoying. Uh, and vaginal discharge, itching or dryness um, can both be side effects of tamoxifen also. Importantly, in premenopausal women, tamoxifen does not cause cancer of the uterus. Uh, and I think that's one of the major fears of women about tamoxifen. And so we can reassure them, particularly if we're treating women 35 to 40, which is probably the best age to, to get in there with preventive tamoxifen, that there is no increased risk of, of preventive uh, tamoxifen in terms of endometrial cancer. Interestingly, when if you look at the SOFT trial, uh, hot flush incidence, after a, a cancer diagnosis was about 80 percent uh, and i think that you know what we we are also a little bit too eager to do is to talk up the side effects of tamoxifen in sympathy with women who have had a breast cancer diagnosis when actually we're probably overstating the side effects when it comes to preventive therapy so I think we need to be a little bit careful and I would much more adopt a give it a go approach. You know, there's probably 50-50 whether you'll develop any side effects. So therefore have a go with preventive tamoxifen. If it causes lots of side effects, there are things we can do or you can just stop and you'll go back to where you were before. So I would stress the reversibility. The risk of DVT and PE is about the same as combined HRT or the oral contraceptive, so it's no greater. I would avoid tamoxifen if there's a strong family history of DVT or PE or proven thrombophilia, but I wouldn't be routinely testing and doing a thrombophilia screen in the absence of a family history. Um, and as I said, the incidence of cancer of the uterus is not increased in the premenopausal women. Many side effects with anastrozole are also common on placebo. And so this is a, a table of the common side effects that are over and above placebo. Um, and, and this is what we've used in our patient information sheet for, for women considering taking um, anastrozole. And you can see that there is an increase in hot flushes compared to placebo, but they're pretty common in postmenopausal women. Joint aches, joint stiffness, vaginal dryness, and high blood pressure, which means that we also advise GPs to check blood pressure routinely on women every year when they're on preventive anastrozole. Uh, in addition, we ask them to check cholesterol, not because um, anastrozole increases cholesterol. That again is not correct. It's in the package insert, um, but it's not true. 
uh, tamoxifen reduces uh, uh, cholesterol and, and as I was saying earlier it's, it's that effect of it, it tamoxifen is, pro, is protective uh, whereas an astrozole is neutral uh, and then there are some things that actually are better with an astrozole there's less in terms of vaginal prolapse vaginal itching and indeed other cancers as well so obviously we do icon arrays to try and, and demonstrate this and from the point of view of arthralgia, I think this is quite important, again, because to, anastrozole has such a bad reputation for causing um, arthralgia. When you look at both the IBIS-2 study and also the MAP-3 study, which was a, a North American study that looked at XMS stain as prevention for five years versus placebo, there's no difference in either trial for the chance of getting grade one uh, hot flushes, but they're in grade two and grade three. So moderate and severe flushes are increased, um, but only by about two to three percent um, of patients. So I don't think there's a huge issue with toxicity when it comes to um, AI and um, arthralgia. Uh, but for some women, approximately one in five, uh, it is intolerable. And in that situation, we would just have to to stop and then consider either tamoxifen or raloxifen. In terms of osteoporosis, I think we all know that um, you know, estrogen is good for the bones. Um, so everybody needs a DEXA scan before starting preventive tamoxifen uh, or shortly afterwards. As long as it's, it's requested, that's fine. If there's severe osteoporosis, which is um, defined as a T-score as a less than minus four, then I would say that not eligible for an astrozole and consider raloxifene. Um, if the bone mineral density is normal, DEXA doesn't need repeating through the five years, but if we've got osteopenia, uh, exclude secondary causes or even minor um, osteoporosis, so um, greater than minus four, uh, ensure, ensure sufficient calcium and vitamin D and then start an oral bisphosphonate. Uh, and with this approach, the fracture rate is not increased uh, and you look here, you can see the MAP3 study, the IBIS2, and also the MA17 study, which was the trial that looked at extended AI after tamoxifen. And in none of these studies do you see a significant increase in fractures. But I think it's worthwhile considering if you've got osteoporosis, raloxifene is obviously a licensed treatment for um, osteo osteoporosis. And if you look at the study, which was the, the, the Ruth, uh, sorry, the, the Moore study, which was in women who had osteoporosis, the risk reduction with raloxifene in that group was pretty high. Uh, and I know that there are caveats. I've already said there are caveats to cross trial comparisons. But actually, I would argue that, you know, you can probably get a very similar effect size with raloxifene in women who have got uh, osteoporosis. Uh, and I would certainly be thinking about that for any T scores less than minus four uh, and, you know, potentially minus three as well. In those women in this study, so this was the IBIS-2 study who had uh, osteoporosis at the minus 2.5 to minus four, um, they were all treated with resedronate. Um, and with resedronate, you can see that both in the lumbar spine on the left and the total hip on the right, there wasn't a reduction in bone mineral density. So we can be reasonably reassured that we will get the benefit in terms of risk reduction, but without um, the, det to the, you know, the detriment in terms of either um, bone mineral density or fractures. What about managing hot flushes and night sweats? There's really no good clinical trial evidence that herbal remedies help. Um, placebo uh, is good, it works in about 25%, but if you do randomized trials, um, placebo controlled trials of, of drugs like Sage or Black Gut Cohosh, they really aren't effective. SSRIs um, can help, things like venlafaxine, and I'd say if it's if it's hot flushes and anxiety, depression, and that's about it, then that's a reasonable place to start. Neuropathic agents such as gabapentin can help, but obviously pregabalin is a is a controlled drug now, so that's not really uh, a way forward. 
But most recently, oxybutynin <clears throat> has been shown to be very effective uh, in women, even on aromatase inhibitors um, for cancer treatment. Um, and you can see here a significant reduction in hot flushes uh, with oxybutynin either at 2.5 BD or slightly more effective at 5 milligrams BD. There are some side effects to oxybutynin, so uh, dry mouth, insomnia, difficulty urinating, it's actually licensed as a treatment for urinary incontinence. Um, but other anti-muscarinics are better tolerated, they've just not been tested yet in this situation. So again, I would say that if we're getting some good effect with, the, <clears throat> uh, uh, with oxybutynin, there's a problem with uh, dry mouth or insomnia, then I would try a different, different uh, uh, anti-muscarinic um, if, if hot flushes is the major problem um, in these women. Spinal dryness is another um, big problem in women and we would we would always say try a uh, non-hormonal um, uh, therapy first um, but again there's very recent data to suggest that very low dose estriol uh, may be okay in women and this this is with a, a drug called blissel um, and you can see on the left hand side significant reductions <clears throat> excuse me um, in, in symptoms and signs of urogenital atrophy um, and really minimal detection of estriol um, on uh, very high sensitivity um, assays uh, normalized by week eight and only a very tight, a slight reduction in LH and FSH. So I would argue that uh, there's better to treat this way uh, and women stay on an AI than stop an AI altogether. Uh, and so I, I'm now routinely recommending uh, low dose estriol in women who are struggling uh, with uh, uh, urogenital atrophy. What about dose reduction? I, we, we, uh, the licensed treatment is for 20 milligrams daily for five years. But there are two recent clinical trials that we need to think about. And the first is the Charisma 2 trial, uh, which has come out of uh, Karolinska. Uh, and this was quite an, uh, 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 an incredible uh, <clears throat> um trial uh, 1440 women looking at six different um, doses not looking at risk reduction but look rather looking at mammographic density reduction as the primary endpoint and then toxicity as the uh, as the secondary and res the results after six months of uh, of treatment was that all but um, 1.25 milligrams was equally effective at reducing mammographic density uh, as the 20 milligram dose. But there were fewer hot, hot flushes uh, with doses less than 10 milligrams, um, but no difference between doses in, in sexual or MSK symptoms. So overall suggesting uh, that the uh, re reduction in, in dose may be effective uh, certainly seem to be less effective in terms of um, uh, toxicity um, and and food for thought. And a very similar time, in fact, just before that, and Andrea De Cenzi in Italy had done a study looking at five milligrams of tamoxifen versus placebo for three years. Um, we're not quite sure why he determined he he he, he decided that three years versus five, but he did. Um, and these are women who women who were doing who were looking at sorry who had DCIS um, or LCIS ADH uh, and had median five years of follow up um, and you can see that there is a significant reduction uh, in breast cancer events including contralateral events uh, with a five milligrams of, of tamoxifen after only just three years. In this study, there was still significant increase in hot flash frequency, uh, but not hot flash score um, or vaginal dryness or arthralgia. So overall, it was pretty good. Um, I would say that we probably still better to start at 20 
as 50% of women won't get hot flushes, but consider dose reduction uh, to 10 or even 5 milligrams if not tolerated. I would also argue, though, that three years is not supported by other data, so I would be trying to set out for five years if we can. What about route of administration? Well, <clears throat> topical pre pre preparations could be the way forward. Uh, topical 4-hydroxy tamoxifen in a small study um, has shown that there is um, comparable reduction in key 67, um, which I've only written here. There's no, no, uh, uh, nothing to see um, to, apart from that. But what you can see is the, the breast adipose tissue on, of 4-hydroxy tamoxifen is comparable, no significant difference, but virtually nothing in the um, plasma um, in topical. So you're just not getting um, the, uh, the, the plasma. So you won't then get um, the uh, DVT uh, and many other side effects. And in addition to that, topical endoxifen has been tested again by Karolinska um, daily placebo versus 10 or 20 milligrams of endoxifen and really incredible reductions in, um, uh, in, in very short time, only about 55 days to reduce um, the, uh, the density of about 14% in 20 milligrams. But that, that resulted quite a lot of skin irritation. So they're trying to work out how they can crack that. But both of these trials suggest that actually we may be able just to do topicals um, to, uh, to prevent breast cancer. But what about sur surgery? <clears throat> Surgical prevention, um, bilateral risk reducing mastectomy with a little timeline here. You can see uh, discovery of BRCA1 and 2 in the 90s. First major report of risk reducing, risk -reducing mastectomy in, in 99. Um, and then Angelina Jolie uh, came along in 2019 uh, and, and really, um, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm struggling to say because I've developed a migraine, so I'm actually struggling to just get some of the, uh, the words together. I do apologize for that. Um, but you can see that Angelina Jolie really stimulated this in, you know, um, stimulated the uh, incidence of um, risk-reducing mastectomy more than doubled, um, and this is the UK in 21 centres, uh, and then it subsided afterwards back down to baseline levels approximately six months thereafter. It's important to just put in the Manchester data here because actually if you look at the pathological variants, so these are almost all BRCA1 and BRCA2 uh, variants, even after Angelina Jolie, still most of those were actually women without pathological variants, but um, they were increased risk because of their family history. And we know that risk reducing mastectomy reduces the risk by around about 94 to 97% and possibly just slightly increases uh, the risk with nipple sparing mastectomy, but that's um, probably with, with um, more uh, recent data suggested that's not quite such an issue. Just to show you that we've got more patients, have more women having um, risk re reduction mastectomy because uh, the, uh, of family history rather than pathological variant. But actually, when you're looking at the, the proportions of number, the, uh, portions of women who have got um, to have risk-reducing mastectomy, then it is more in proportion having the uh, this with a pathological variant, so this is a BRCA1 or 2, uh, and then declining numbers or declining proportions having uh, mastectomy uh, at, with declining risks. And the risks here are 20 to 29, 30 to 39, and 40 to 49 percent. Uh, and it's just that there are more of these women there uh, uh, um, to have um, uh, risk uh, rather than the rather rarer group who have BRCA1 and 2. And you can see here that BRCA1 and 2 are more likely to have risk producing mastectomy uh, the younger they are uh, to have the genetic test. 
There are some additional factors associated with uptake, and you can see here that sisters are diagnosed with breast cancer less than 50, mother diagnosed under 60, having children and benign breast biopsies are all associated with risk reduction. If you want to have a bit more information, I su suggest you go to Macmillan. Um, and this is really a great um, pamphlet for patients. It's 40 odd pages long, uh, but it's also very good for medical oncology trainees who want to know about the difference in breast reconstruction options, uh, because it summarizes that very, very nicely uh, about the opportunities. So what about lifestyle prevention? Um, General health of women attending for preventive tamoxifen is not optimal. Uh, we know there's an obesity epidemic and, and, and women who are increased risk also are obese uh, or overweight, about 60% in our case in, in Manchester. There are also still a proportion of smoking uh, and about 45% uh, have uh, excess alcohol. The weight gain from age 20 and overweight obesity in and beyond the perimenopause are significantly associated with postmenopausal breast cancer risk. And so what can we do about that? Uh, and Michelle Harvey in Manchester has looked at what may be the way that we can reduce risk by telling women what their risk, sorry, reducing the risk by giving them the risk information. Uh, and you can see that moderately increased and highly increased versus average or low can see an uptake of about twofold and retention of about threefold um, in these women. So pro providing them risk information can just help to then induce diet, dietary intervention. And that in itself is very powerful. And this is looking at weight loss as an important preventive measure so a pooled analysis of 10 prospective studies has shown that significant weight loss is dose dependent or results in a dose dependent reduction in breast cancer risk. And you can see that here uh, with pretty much a significant reduction or sorry, it's very much a significant reduction akin to that um, of tamoxifen. So, in summary, I would say that proactive, um, we should be proactive to recommend breast cancer prevention to women at increased risk. Tamoxifen in pre-menopausal uh, pre and anastrozole in post uh, are the agents of first choice. Uh, and side effect profiles are well known, and they're probably less in women who have had a breast cancer diagnosis. And about a half of premenopausal women don't have significant side effects, so why not give it a go? Dose reductions, supportive medications are very helpful to keep uh, people adhering. Uh, and we must look after the general health of women at increased breast cancer risk. Losing weight is as effective as tamoxifen, but I would do both in sequence. So that we can reduce the side effects of tamoxifen, the risk of DVT, if we can get women to lose weight first and then add tamoxifen in at that point. And risk reducing mastectomy remains the gold standard uh, for those at high risk in terms of risk reduction. So apologies for going on and also not being able to talk. Um, but apart from that, I'll be more than happy to welcome questions. While we see if we have some questions come through the chat, uh, I wanted to ask is, um, you know, with regards to chemo, chemo prevention, that's a word I shouldn't have used, um, <laughs> according to you. So the the time frame for that being five years um and and you said that the the reduction in in risk seems to continue beyond the five years of therapy i guess my question is is that because there's an ongoing biological change because of the five years of therapy or is it because during that five years you have prevented a number of um abnormal cells developing and, and you're just seeing that reduction continuing in the long term. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, we th that that's the great question, really, which is, you know, is, is why does it persist? And I think that it's effectively saying that you are switching off those abnormal cells. It has to. Otherwise, if this was just a temporary phenomenon that you had five years of treatment and you just sort of suppressed, you've got a cytostatic effect, then you stop the drug 
then those cells will go on and cause a problem again and you'll develop the breast cancer. So we've got now 16 years. In fact, we've got the data. They're just not presented and published yet out to 20 years of follow up. Um, and it's the same thing. And if, if anything, it, it, you know, the curves with tamoxifen are slightly um, diverging still. So, so that must mean you've got rid of those clones. Um, and similarly with an astrazole, although not quite as, as, uh, um, uh, as, as impressive. Alex has, has also um, said, hello, is there any evidence that pregnancy carries an increased risk of breast cancer for women who are already at increased risk? And if so, what advice would you give them? Um, so yes, uh, pregnancy does increase the risk in women who are over the age of 30. Um, and so younger age is protective, over the age of 30 is, it increases the risk. It's a very difficult one because, you know, how do we how do we really talk about that? It's it's not a major risk factor, um, and if we're there, we I think we have to say that you know, having a late pregnancy will increase the risk somewhat, but women will want, often want to to have a family, and this is a relatively small risk compared to their single nucleotide polymorphisms. Certainly, if they've got a BRCA1 or a BRCA2 mutation, um, you know, there are bigger risk factors out there, but that is part of the risk prediction models. Great. Thanks for answering that. I, um, just to, while we wait to see if any more questions come through, I, I did have another question, which is that I guess these are quite difficult um, uh, concepts to explain, potentially, uh, in terms of risk reduction. Um, we know that that's something that patients often can't grasp when we talk in terms of relative risk. Um, I saw you used some sort of icon array style images um, to show the, the changes um, in, in risk reduction. It, so I just wondered what your approach is to trying to explain what could be quite a complex um, concept to women who come through the clinic. So always trying to um, explain in the terms of absolute risk. <clears throat> So I think we all should be trying to do that. Absolute risk and number needed to treat um, are the most important parts of, of, of trying to explain risk to patients. I think relative risk, we should just try and avoid completely. Um, it's incredibly difficult to, uh, to, to, to work out what it means for oncologists, let alone patients. Um, so that's why, even though it's not um, you know, the absolute perhaps way of doing it in terms of if I were a statistician, just explaining it in the terms of this is what we'll get in placebo, this is what we get with, with an astrazole, therefore we have an 8% increase in the patients that get whatever it is, hot flushes or joint aches. And then generally speaking, that small increase over the background will not frighten, frighten women off and we can then deal with any side effects when they uh, when they happen, so ab absolute risk is is by far the best way of doing it than relative. Yeah, definitely. And are there any um, risk prediction um, tools that you can use in the clinic to demonstrate this sort of thing? Uh, uh, well, I think Emma might be about to sort of it's talk about that. Your horses. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll hold that thought. <laughs> Thank you. Hold it there. Okay, great. Yes, Emma's um, going to lead on beautifully now to do this. Yeah, that's a really great lead in. <laughs> Thank you. So thanks very much, Sasha, for the talk and for answering those questions. Um, no so, so it's my great pleasure to introduce our second speaker of the night now. Um, Dr. Emma Woodward is a consultant clinical geneticist at St. Mary's Hospital in Manchester. Uh, she studied medicine in Cambridge, where she also completed a PhD studying familial chromocytoma and familial renal cancer. She undertook specialist training in clinical genetics in Birmingham, during which time she received an NIHR clinician scientist award and undertook further study of familial renal cancer. She became a consultant in 2008 and joined the Manchester Centre for Genomic Medicine in 2015. Her current research is aimed at understanding the inherited pre 
predisposition to cancer, in particular thyroid cancer, and whether structural genomic variants influence cancer predisposition risk. Um, clinical specialist interest is in the inherited predisposition to endocrine tumours and renal cancer. Well, that's quite a mouthful. I hope I got all of that right, Emma. <laughs> so um, when you're ready, over to you. Please go ahead and share your screen. So I'm um, up the road in MFT in genetics, and I'm going to talk about breast cancer in the genetics clinic. Um, I should say there was a bit of overlap with Sasha's talk, but hopefully not too much. And bits that there are, I'll just skip through. Um, I've actually put in a few super basic slides, because actually, if nobody tells you this stuff, you never know it. And everybody just assumes you know everything. So there's a group of us up in genetics at St Mary's. Um, Gareth, you'll all know myself. Claire has just recently joined us, having been a registrar. And Fiona, we've a new consultant genetic counsellor, and we've a whole team of genetic counsellors who basically do all the hard work. And we have registrars rotating through. Um, I must put in our laboratory colleagues here because actually we work hand in glove with our laboratory colleagues. And again, they do the lion's share of all the genetic workup. Um, Bit of background, why do we do familial cancer? So the aim of cancer geneticists is to improve outcome for individuals who either have or at increased risk of a hereditary tumour. Um, clearly, the vogue of the past few years has been large scale sequencing studies, but they don't always distinguish what are those key driver mutations from passenger mutations. So by studying the rare familial forms of cancer, we get clues to the rate limiting steps in tumour development. They have implications for the sporadic cancers, um, novel therapeutic strategies, increased genetic risk, and what we're all about, uh, myself and Sasha, cancer prevention and early detection strategies. Um, but very simply, again, if nobody says this, you sort of don't have this little um, tree to hang things on. We essentially divide things into the genetic predisposition to common cancers, and to the rare things. And with the common cancers, that's um, clearly breast cancer is going to fit into that. You get familial clustering, early onset, multiple primary tumours, but they don't really have that very clear phenotypic marker. And then we also look after individuals with a very rare familial cancer syndromes. And it's that distinct phenotype with those clustering of rare, rare cancers. Um, I'm sure you've all seen this, but I find it immensely helpful. Um, germline genetics, breast cancer predisposition, rare and common. So if you think of each of these um, little squares and dots as um, risk alleles, essentially the sort of rule of thumb in um, germline genetics is that um, the super rare alleles cause the greatest effect. So the sort of classic example here is going to be TP53, which I will talk about briefly. Um, super rare, but crikey, you wouldn't wish anybody had to have TP53 because the high penetrance is um, very marked. And then right at the other end, very common, but individually each conferring a very small risk or SNPs, which I will mention briefly and I know Sasha kindly touched upon. BRCA1 and 2, I will talk about, they are slightly odd, and a couple of slides on this, because actually, um, when there's a mutation, it does have a large effect, but they are not just as rare as, you, as one might think. Um, and that sort of leads on nicely onto this slide. Um, and actually, you're talking, Rachel, about explaining stuff to in clinic. So I tend to use pie charts. Um, Hereditary and talk of high risk breast cancer is only a sort of small proportion of what tends to be called sporadic. And of, if you think about familial breast cancer, that's mostly going to be accounted for by the relatively common low penetrance alleles. And then what we deal with up the road in genetics are these very rare, highly penetrant alleles. Initially, BRCA1 and 2, they definitely do account for the majority, and they're a thought of a population frequency individually of less than 1%, but actually more recent population data, I would say, probably puts it about 1.5%, but not higher that you'll see in some studies that are subject to gross ascertainment bias. 
And then the others, PAL B2, TP53, then we're really getting into the terribly rare stuff, but super important not to miss. Um, must just mention there are sort of three common um, finder mutations, uh, two in BRCA1, one in BRCA2. You wouldn't need to know the details ever, but they are common in the Ashkenazi Jewish population. And this one in BRCA2 is actually an Eastern European finder mutation. So um, whilst I am going to talk about all these thresholds for genetic testing, this is really important to consider separately. If you see um, a woman or a family of Ashkenazi Jewish heritage or strong Eastern European heritage, you have a very low threshold for either letting us know or if you're doing testing, um, testing for these mutations because they are common and it would be terrible to miss them when present. Um, BRCA1 and BRCA2, they get lumped together. I suppose essentially they are terribly similar, unimaginatively described, because guess what? They find BRCA from one first and then BRCA2. Um, essentially, they're high risk um, breast and ovarian cancer genes. The ovarian risk is a little lower in BRCA2. In men, um, the breast cancer risk is much more marked with BRCA2 than BRCA1, and there's a prostate risk of BRCA2, which is not borne out in BRCA1. And it's worth bearing in mind with BRCA2, you can sometimes see these clustering of other cancers, pancreas, melanoma, and cholangio. So um, I know in the oncology clinic, you're dead push, but you do take great histories. And when you just see things like melanomas or pancreases popping up, do um, think BRCA2. In terms of the risk conferred, so um, all studies over the years have been subject to ascertainment bias because everybody collects their favourite cohort of patients. But um, earlier this year, there were two mammoth studies published, the Carriers in the New England Journal, the Carriers study and the Bridges study. And they've been super helpful because they have essentially identified, or I shouldn't say identified, they have calculated what are the odds ratio um, of the that is conferred by pathogenic gene variants in these genes. Each study was subtly different, which we'll, we'll not go into about how they classified their variants, and whether they looked for missense or truncating variants. But the essential take home message is BRCA1, BRCA2 and PALB2, high risk genes. PALB2, when it was first identified, was given the label of being a moderate risk breast cancer gene. It's really in that high risk category, albeit maybe not just as high as BRCA1 and 2. Um, Sasha will have heard endless discussions about ATM and CHECK2. Essentially, they are moderate risk breast cancer genes. And we don't currently offer testing for, but um, that is to change and we most definitely should do. And just to touch on what you were talking about, um, Rachel, just before I started, odds ratios are really helpful to professionals in the clinic, but that needs to be translated into what does that risk mean for the woman in the clinic? And there are actually some phenotypic correlations. And what you tend to see, which is borne out in these studies, but BRCA1 and 2, Eastern receptor negative tumours, and quite often triple negative, PALB2 triple negatives. Um, Sasha and I undertook a study on our Manchester patients. And again, that'll be subject to ascertainment bias because they're patients that have come through genetics or the family history risk and prevention clinic at Withenshaw. So they're biased for having a family history and you don't get through the doors of genetics unless you're high risk. So our odds ratios were a little higher, but again, we pulled out, sadly, you're predisposed to getting these nasty cancers. Um, so in the non-finder populations, what is the likelihood of BRCA1 to? The reason for us, why is it so important to know what the likelihood of BRCA1 and 2 is? Essentially, the NHS will offer testing where there is a greater than equal to 10% likelihood of a BRCA1 or 2 mutation. And there are various algorithms to work out what that likelihood is. And some of them then also lead into what is the lifetime risk of developing a breast cancer. I have a few slides on each. Um, Professor Evans and Fiona uh, and Professor Heil um, worked at Manchester Score. And essentially that's a brilliant 
piece of paper in front of you in the clinic and it works out what is the likelihood of um, this person having an underlying BRCA1 or 2 mutation. Um, Tara Kuzik, again, this is available online, also does a cancer risk assessment too. And then more laterally, can risk is like the go-to tool, which works out the likelihood of a mutation and cancer risk assessment. They all have their foibles, I should say. So the Manchester Scoring System, um, FBC stands for female breast cancer, male breast cancer. If you've got a male breast cancer, clearly that um, influences the likelihood of an underlying mutation and ovarian cancer too. And essentially you draw your pedigree and we confirm as many of the cancers as we can through um, histology and cancer registry records and you tot up in direct lineage. Some people think you can um, do maternal and paternal you've got to do it in direct lineage. And essentially, once you get to the score of 15, that equates to a 10% likelihood um, and a score of 20 to a 20% likelihood. The more we have learned about these MBRCA1 and 2, um, Gareth has refined the score to account for pathology. If a woman has a HER2 positive breast cancer, the like that diminishes very markedly the likelihood of that being BRCA1 or 2 similar with lobular. So when you see these nasty grade three ER negative, triple negative tumours, that um, BRCA1 and 2 are much more likely. Again, high grade serous ovarian cancer associated. There is no association with endometrial cancer, nor we often get referrals with borderline tumours and um, mucinous ovarian tumours. No, oops, sorry, they're not BRCA. And we also just have to make an adjustment for individuals um, who are adopted and then don't know anything about their own family history. Um, this is sort of what you see with can risk. I've put in the link so that, oh, it was on the previous slide, I apologise, that you can click on. And essentially, it's quite in depth. You need to set aside a cup of tea and 20 minutes to do this, but you put in personal details, all the risk factors, press the button, and it comes out with a breast and ovarian risk likelihood. IBIS is also online, it's much more simple to use. Like any computer algorithm, just think about the score you get out, because sometimes they do come out with something which you just know in your heart is not right, and then you ask a colleague. Um, importantly, they're incorporating other additional factors of risk, namely SNPs and mammographic density, not just family history. Um, this is a very simple overview that, um, for me really, um, denser, breast denser breast tissue is associated with increased risk of breast cancer and they are harder to see on a mammogram. Um, one used scoring system um, is Biorad and essentially a one end of the spectrum, um, fatty breast tissue, not dense at all low risk of breast cancer and if you do get one it's easier to see right up to the other end of the spectrum where the breast tissue is very dense, sadly puts you at higher risk and then if the breast cancer does develop it is harder for the radiologist to pick out. SNPs. These are essentially low penetrance genetic modifiers. Um, I think the latest count up is over 300 SNPs associated with breast cancer risk. Um, this is so important. It has all been validated in white European populations and there's a dearth of data for other um, populations. So um, if you're doing this in clinic or suggesting somebody pursues it, just think about their ethnicity and whether the data will be relevant to them. Um, each SNP individually confers a very small risk and then you multiply the genotype odds ratios to obtain a polygenic risk score. Um, and that probably accounts for the remaining heritability of familial breast cancer. Um, I doubt very much there is a high risk breast ovarian cancer gene yet to be identified. And they're really important because it's implications for early detection. And um, it's essentially all about that personalized risk management and then personalized um, prevention and early detec detection strategies being put in place. Um, 
And this, I put in this slide just to show actually how much SNPs can change things. So admittedly, this was in a Finnish population and Finnish population is not truly reflective of a European population in terms of their genetics. But um, the Finns do great genetic studies. Um, and they did this lovely study where they um, looked at individuals, BRCA1, BRCA2, plus minus family history, and then combined that with a high-risk polygenic risk score and a low-risk polygenic risk score. And essentially, if you have got in the Finnish population, BRCA2, a high-risk polygenic risk score and a risk of family history, your risk is sadly very high. And that shoots right down to 43% if you've got a low-risk polygenic risk score. And you can see here when they looked at CHECK2 and PALB2, CHECK2, which we call a moderate risk gene, if you've got a CHECK2 pathogenic gene variant and a high risk poly polygenic risk score, well, your risk is actually ends up being higher than having a PALB2 mutation, which we count as high risk, and a um, favourable polygenic risk score. Um, so this is kind of all working towards the future. Um, as you said, the, the near future, and that's, you know, our holy grail is a personalised risk stratification based, based on pathogenic gene variant and high risk gene plus or minus their SNP profile. Um, and we combine that then ultimately with mammographic density, hormonal factors and family history. Um, I put in this slide, I thought, oh, I haven't put this in, and then I saw Sasha had it in. Um, this is the terminology that we use to what's population moderate and high risk, and they are the nice definitions excuse me, that um, Sasha said, you've got to put your flag in the sand somewhere. And it means we're all talking the same language. And we will be, moderate risk is that 17 to 30% lifetime risk and that 10 year risk between 40 and 53 to 8%. High risk is anything over and above that. And I've got a slide, um, very recently there's been introduced this in very high risk category. In thinking of breast cancer early detection in high risk women, as you know, everybody, their women are offered um, MRI surveillance and that's come out of the Marabs trial, which actually I'm um, getting quite old now. And this is a picture I um, paste, copied and pasted from it. Um, MRI, 33 year old BRCA1 carrier, one year interval. And this invasive grade three cancer was picked up with the irregular margins and rim enhancement. And um, this was sort of their follow up study of, or I shouldn't say the follow up study, it was the follow up data from that study. And they did pick up 39 breast cancers. Whether this translates into improved outcomes, um, in fact, um, a Canadian study and essentially the mortality over 20 years from breast cancer was not increased over and above that population risk and the most common cause of death was ovarian cancer. I should say since I've put that slide together Gareth has written up um, the local Manchester data. The high risk breast cancer category all got a bit woolly in terms of of what was risk equivalent to having a mutation, not having a mutation, and then who got MRI and who didn't. So in terms of screening, I should say surveillance options, um, just very recently, we've I haven't brought in public health as well as brought in this very high risk group. And essentially to make it into that very high risk group, you really have to have a mutation in one of these um, high, high risk genes. Effectively, it equates to a 40% lifetime risk or greater of breast cancer. And these are the interventions, um, MRI plus minus mammography. Of note, it used to be in BRCA carriers, we could only start MRI at 30. It has now been dropped down to 25. And I have a slide on TP53, but anybody's TP53 must not get mammography because their cells are so radiosensitive. And I've just copied and pasted the um, form, which is available on the web and actually it's a heck of a lot more simple than it used to be. Um, Sasha is clearly also a fan of the Macmillan Risk Reducing Breast Surgery booklet. It is fabulous. Um, many women 
who are at high risk, as Sasha said, up to very high, but basically about 25% lifetime risk or greater will elect to have risk reducing surgery, mostly with reconstruction, but not everybody goes um, down that route. And risk reduction, the literature says 90 to 95% reduction as Sasha says it's probably a bit higher than that um it's deliberately quite a slow process taking over six months and that is essentially because it's irreversible life-changing surgery and um, the woman you just want to be sure that it's the right thing for you and to be prepared for what the surgical outcomes may be um and it includes a, um appointment with our Julia, our clinical psychologist, surgical consultations, and we've lots of MDT discussions and also under long-term follow-up. And this booklet is really good. It's got lots of great photos in it. So um, we offer it to all the women. Um, this is one, as um, Sasha said, one of the first studies from the US showing the 90% um, greater than 90% risk reduction in risk-reducing surgery. Oh, and I have put in. Um, the slide from um, Gareth and the Manchester Clinic, again, we got about a 96% risk reduction. Chemo prevention, I'm not going to talk about because Sasha did that beautifully and I, I couldn't ever um, hope to um, reach that level. But essentially, the risk lasts, as you discussed, way beyond that initial five years. So go for it. Mm. I'm going to talk a little bit about laboratory testing because we do work so closely with our laboratory colleagues um, and genetic testing has gone on, undergone a massive upheaval in um, the UK. So we're now part of the North West Genomic Laboratory Hub, which is essentially um, Liverpool and Manchester labs combined. There is a new website and I also need to say that it's the one NHS England said we had to use. It's not an in-house one because actually it's not the most straightforward. Germline genetic testing comes under rare disease. I will not go into, because as oncologists you will be far more expert than me, um, all the special testing of tumour tissue that the laboratory offers. In the genetics clinic, our hands are pretty tied as to what genetic testing we can offer. And I have put in some slides on referral criteria because essentially we could not see everybody we get referred. So if you write letters to us, you get them bounced. I'm sort of trying to explain why. There is a National Genomic Test Directory, which came into being. This is the latest iteration. It came into being about a year ago. In one sense, it's very good because it offers equitable testing up and down the country, so that no matter which genetics clinic you go to, you ought to be offered the same testing. The downside is it's quite strict and you might feel there's nuances that are being missed and actually patient X should perhaps have testing for gene Y. So there are very strict criteria. I've just copied them off, but there's the web links. We'll not go through them all. Um, Essentially, very strict. So, all triple negatives less than 60 can be done, and that can be done in the mainstream setting. Currently, the only genes we can test for are BRCA1, BRCA2, and PALB2. Um, that's a bit of a bone of contention, but hopefully, coming in next year, it will be ATM and check two. One of the reasons why, well, the main reason why it's so strict is it's that 10% threshold of a BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation. BRCA1 and 2 are huge genes. And this is where it is so important. You've got to think about the laboratory colleagues too, because there is the wet lab work of um, sequencing the genes, finding the variants, but the bioinformatics exercise in going through any variants identified and classifying them accurately is a mammoth piece of work and it is not an amateur sport so this is where a genetic test is not necessarily just the be all and end all. There are evidence-based rules and that 
is quite appropriate because they've got to be accurate and equivalent. So we go by in the UK, the American College of Medical Genetics Standards. This is based on functional data. And it's really important to know what this classification system means. So we classify variants basically into five classes. What we deal with in the clinic are essentially class fours and fives, those that are likely pathogenic and those that are definitely pathogenic. These class three variants of uncertain significance are really quite challenging. And why do we need to get it right? Um, this is a bit of an old article now, but um, it's an article from Time. And essentially, you do not want to be doing risk-reducing surgery in somebody with a VUS or even worse in a class two variant. So that's why the invariant interpretation has got to be absolutely spot on and which is why we do need thresholds of who we offer testing to rather than just everyone. Um, I'm now going to talk about a few rare things um, only because you might see them, you might never see them, but um, it's our job as geneticists not to miss them, but just in case they do wander through your clinic. Um, Cowden syndrome, you get benign and malignant tumour predisposition syndrome, about one in 200,000 people. There are detailed diagnostic criteria that I will not go into, but the main features are very, very marked macrocephaly and mucocutaneous lesions. Sometimes um, individuals can have autistic spectrum disorder with or without some learning difficulties. These women, well, men and women are equally affected, but for the women, they have a very, very high risk of breast cancer and um, for which MRI surveillance or risk-reducing surgery um, can be offered. And I have actually had women um, referred with breast and um, ovarian cancer, you get the confirmation of the ovarian cancer. It wasn't an ovarian cancer, it was ovarian fibromas. And the lady sat in front of you with a very marked microcephaly, and then you know it's not BRCA1 or 2 you should be thinking about. Hereditary diffuse gastric cancer, truly horrible. Um, individuals, the main risk is these poorly differentiated adenoCAs of diffuse histology. They are not intestinal. Um, from the gastric side, you get intensive surveillance and most people um, elect to have prophylactic gastrectomy. For women with CDH1, there's also an increased risk of developing breast cancer and these tend to be of lobular histology for which surveillance and risk-reducing surgery is offered. But interestingly, if you gather up women with lobular breast cancer and um, not pay regard to the gastric cancer family history, only about 1% have a CDH1 mutation. Um, Lee Freimani syndrome, caused by germline P53, individuals develop multiple primary tumours, they get very young onset breast cancer, it was about a 30% risk by age 30 years, um, children get adrenocortical, adrenocortical carcinomas, there's also risk of CNS tumours and soft tissue sarcomas and osteosarcomas and cells are highly radiosensitive which is why if a woman has a TP53 mutation and is having surveillance that must be by MRI and not mammography in the mix at all. Um, this is a study from the French group and basically very sadly you can see that that tumour risk just starts to climb and climb from birth and the high risk in females is accounted for by that increased breast cancer risk. And again, getting on my soapbox, you see lots of stuff published where class two and class three variants, oh, they've got Lee Freimani syndrome, they don't. And as you can see from this, it is a diagnosis with enormous implications. So you've got to get the variant interpretation correct. Um, this is basically saying the same thing. And in terms of surveillance, we get annual whole body MRI, that's incorrect. I've written from 30, it's not, it's from 18. And we're now starting to do MRI in children. We talked um, in the breast cancer setting, or Sasha did about lifestyle and smoking. It's really sad, but some people do, and you just have to work with them. Sadly, um, especially in Lee syndrome, you know, 
they will have lost family members at a young age and it's all that social stress and everything that often leads people to smoke. So we do our best and work with them, clearly avoid excess ionising radiation. In terms of the breast cancers, they are really young and exact opposite of BRCA1 and 2. These are high, HER2 positive. And if you see high grade DCI, DCIS, as the pathologist said, it's comedo, comedo DCIS, which essentially is a marker for saying the cells have actually died and have become necrotic because of that for being aggressive. Think TP53. Um, I've said annual MRI from 30, it's not, it has come down, and many women will consider risk reducing surgery. And the last one, point shakers. Um, it's always very common in medical school, point shakers, but not so much in the real world. This um, typical mucocutaneous freckling. Their main risk in life, sadly, is GI cancers, but the women do also have a very high breast cancer risk. And I have seen women, sadly, with GI cancers and breast cancer. So again, high risk breast screening, and some will consider risk reducing breast surgery. Um, I'm just going to finish up with a bit about referrals and why you might write a referral and it might sadly get bounced. Um, personal history of breast cancer that meets criteria for genetic testing and your clinic annotations from the oncology clinic are fabulous. Just include as much histology and staging information as you have in any family history. Um, we completely appreciate that rare things do happen. So you might think, oh, this lady would never meet criteria for testing, but crikey, she's got some rare tumours in her family, then do still refer them. High grade serious ovarian cancer, if that's in the family too, that's straight in through the door, please. Unaffected women, this is more from a family history clinic rather than yourselves, but if that risk assessment comes out at a greater 25% lifetime risk and the woman's thinking about risk producing surgery, please send them to us. Unaffected women with a family history of breast cancer, they go to family history clinics. Sometimes um, from oncology clinics, we actually don't get the ladies got breast cancer referred, but they've come to the oncology clinic with their daughter who's worried that daughter needs to get her GP to refer her to the family history clinic. Um, I know through the Christie with um, your really good phase one trials unit, research findings, we have set up a monthly MDT. So all those queries go to there first, because what was happening was we were seeing people in clinic, and this is not a criticism of what was sent, it was all that was available with limited information. And we were left having very awkward conversations where there is a mismatch between what we could actually offer in the genetics clinic and patient expectation. And I think the rule of thumb is we really only accept referrals or we have something to offer over and above secondary care. And our hands are somewhat tied by the genetic testing we can offer. Um, a few exceptions. Lee Farmani syndrome. The new mutation rate in Lee Farmani is actually really, really high. It's up to about 50%. So any young onset breast cancers, less than 30, please send them up. And... Um, we stretched up a bit to about 33 if they're HER2 positive, and especially this comedian DCIS. Um, I finished, but essentially I've talked about hereditary predisposition to breast cancer, a bit on risk assessment, a bit on genetic testing, a bit on what we do, opportunities for cancer prevention and early detection. I did not touch on somatics and PARP inhibitors because you folks are the experts, not me. Um, ask any questions and um, thank you to all the people I work with. While we wait to see if there's any questions that come through in the chat, I wondered um, how close you are to being able to use SNP testing to um, uh, categorise women in terms of risk. Um, it doesn't look like something you were able to test routinely, but you said that you thought it might be a it's on its way. The lab are setting it up and it is, and do please interrupt Sasha, I believe it's sort of on its way, if not quite arrived at the Family History Clinic. Okay, thanks. Um, I don't think we have Sasha on the call anymore. Okay, so have to have to that on. One, yeah, it's, it's, watch this space and the lab are setting it up. 
it's probably something more that would be in um, secondary care in the first instance, but it's definitely available in the private sector and lots of people do. Um, and the other thing I should have mentioned about SNP scores is it's very individual based. So um, we do genetic testing in a family. So if you've, let's say you've got two sisters with um, breast cancer, if the breast cancers were quite similar and you did genetic testing in one sister and didn't find anything, you probably wouldn't do it in the second. Whereas SNP scores are A, the for unaffected. And actually, because you're looking at so many different SNPs, you have to do it on a, all on an individual basis. Okay, so that would just be in people who had already been affected by breast no, cancer. SNP scores are for unaffected. Unaffected women. Okay, okay. Why is there not a rationale for SNP testing in people who have been affected or for their families? You can do it for the families. Because if you've already got it, probably doesn't change a lot. Mm. And yeah. the point, and I probably should have made it clear in my talk, if you've got a high risk, let's say you and you know you've got breast cancer and then you find BRSA one, two, whatever, then you can think about ovarian management and all those other management options. Yeah, sure. That makes sense. Whereas with the SNP score, you kind of sadly already know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I also wondered in terms of kind of surveillance for women at high risk. Um, I, I don't personally understand the rationale for both MR and mammogram. It seemed like there would be a subset of women who would undergo both those screening investigations. And I wonder what the mammogram adds to that? Um, essentially, my understanding, and I'm not really on the chest, is what we try and do it with insurance is offset them by six months. And um, radiologists love to compare scans. And sometimes, you know, you might see a bit of blob on one and then you can go and see if it was on the other. And I need to pull out that marrow's paper. I'm... I have a feeling some may have been visible on mammogram, but maybe just not on MRI. Yeah, okay. So it's more, uh, you know, for the purpose of comparison and the interval. Between yeah, and it would be unethical. Nobody's ever going to do a trial of you go on the mammography arm and you go on the MRI arm. You know, that that's not going to happen. Yeah. In terms of kind of the, the, the service and um, you said you're receiving a lot of referrals that you, you have to write back and either perhaps ask for more information or perhaps it's not an appropriate referral. Um, are, the, are most of those referrals coming from oncologists or do you also get a lot of quite queries oh, from GPs as well? Um, we the, get lots from GPs. Lots and lots and lots. And um, we get quite a few from Family History Clinic and that's where, in fairness, the person's been around the right route, they've been to Family History Clinic, they've had their risk assessed. Um, there's a slight mismatch with what we can do and the nice guidance I think that Sasha referred to currently says, if you're at high risk, you need assessing in the genetics clinic, full stop. Whereas actually, we kind of only really want to see people that we can do something for and that's, a, because we're completely swamped, but B, and especially pre-COVID when people were travelling, because we're a regional service, so if you've driven two hours to see us and we go, oh, okay, yes, you're at high risk, it's sorted. You know, that's quite an unsatisfactory clinic outcome for all concerned. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm, you know, potentially very anxiety provoking isn't it for oh totally and i mean i've been to mft but you know the stress of actually trying to park a car already on top of the whole thing it's just yeah so yeah, absolutely really yeah see people where we've actually got somebody to offer we've got something to offer yeah absolutely well, thank you so much for the talk i'm not sure we're going to get any more questions in the chat um, I've just opened a poll for the attendees. If they could complete that just to indicate um, who's, who's watched this webinar tonight. 
Um, and thank you so much, Emma, for that really interesting, really comprehensive talk. I think it's really, really great to have. Um, I apologise if it was a bit basic, but I thought nobody ever tells you this stuff and then you're supposed to work it out by magic. No, no, I, well, I certainly didn't find it basic at all. <laughs> um, I think it's really good to have a bit of uh, interdisciplinary um, teaching from services that we're often actually referring to. Um, so thank you so much for that.